Okay, uh, my presentation is on democratic backsliding. Um, <clears throat> so I usually uh, like to break down uh, articles uh, in the order that they emerge in the literature, um, uh, mainly so that we can see like what the authors knew uh, up until that point and see like the evolution of the literature. But I'm a bit uh, uncertain as to which came first, the Slater piece or the Levitsky Loxton piece. Um, in either case, uh, I'll start with the Slater piece, um, as it makes a, a fairly straightforward distinction in how we conceptualize backsliding. Uh, specifically, Slater points out the fact that, that Latin American regimes uh, didn't experience a, a third uh, a third wave reverse uh, towards authoritarianism, uh, despite scholars' uh, expectations that the, the wave of democratization uh, would rubber band back uh, into authoritarianism. Um, Slater points out that the democratic collapse or the traditional backsliding uh, that scholars posited is exceedingly rare uh, in the 21st century. Um, and second piece is that they, the regimes themselves aren't necessarily consolidating into more developed democracies, so they're not necessarily moving towards uh, full democracies either. Instead, they are careening. So Slater defines this careening more or less as, as regimes experience a experiencing a high potential for collapse. Essentially, the state is moving up and down the continuum uh, from authoritarianism to, to higher levels of democratization and can experience a sudden jolt uh, backwards. Uh, so this, this careening process is, is really fascinating to me. Uh, what this careening means is that the regime is, is uh, for the regime, is that the the regime can experience a, a, a capsizing effect and have its institutional processes become non-functional for a period of time, uh, but it can still have all of the trappings of democratization, um, albeit in bankrupt shape. And we'll see later on how this uh, this facade of democracy is a bit problematic in categorizing a regime as a, a democracy or an authoritarian regime or some form of uh, authoritarian uh, authoritarianism uh, specifically because it has all the trappings of democracy um now the reason for this uh wobbly state is because of the tension between vertical and horizontal accountability essentially there's a tension between those who want inclusivity and those who want to keep the democratic constraints on excessive uh concentrated power in the hands of the executive which is reminiscent of a, of a debate between Hamilton and Jefferson in the United States. So Hamilton wanted a, a stronger executive to counteract the, legislative, uh, the legislature's growing power, while Jefferson wanted to constrain the powers of the president, particularly when it uh, concerned re-elections. What's interesting is that both philosophical orientations are correct, uh, constraining the executive, horizontal accountability, is obviously important, as, as other articles will show, the, the executive is truly constrained by the other branches. And the typical first move in seizing power is to eliminate institutional checks. However, skewing too far into the camp of horizontal accountability, the executive constraints can, can skew the state towards oligarchy, uh, where a few influential people uh, rule over the majority. But in the other corner, we have the populist uh, president carrying a heavy mandate in one hand and a chisel uh, he plans to use to free the masses from oligarchic control uh, from a detached legislature uh, in the other hand. Um, the calls for inclusivity and vertical accountability have their, their obvious appeals. And the next article does a does well to explain like how it can't go wrong. And that's the Levitsky and, and Loxton uh, piece. Prior to 2013, there was, there was little agreement as to the precise cause of mechanism linking populism to democratic breakdown. Levitsky, Levitsky Levisky and Loxton uh, examined the emergence of competitive authoritarianism in Latin America after 1990. Specifically, they conducted a comparative analysis of 14 presidents in Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, yeah, and as well, from 1990 to 2010. Uh, they posited. <clears throat> Three reasons why populist candidates push developing democracies into competitive authoritarianism. First was that given the populist sentiment that, that brought them to office, once elected, the executive uses their mandate to dismantle the prevailing power structure. The second thing is the, the, the executive tends to eliminate institutions which could serve as a check on their power. Uh, and the third is by nature of being an outsider, the executive typically lacks the requisite experience or inclination to work within the bounds of the set by the democratic uh, institutions.
this is fascinating because essentially when you have a, a strong man president or uh, a personalist dictator uh, coming to power and trying to galvanize support both at the constituent level and also like uh, dismantling the the horizontal accountability within the regime they have a common vernacular which i don't think we really like pointed to but strong men sound very similar and i was listening to chavez and a few other dictators through history and i was listening to trump in particular and a lot of the things they say in their typical appeals are very very similar and i don't know i don't know how much has been flushed out in the comparative literature um i know there's a lot of work on propaganda um and i think that the next uh evolution of that would would be to see the parallels between modern propaganda and former propaganda. But in either case, um, I'm going to show a video on uh, Chavez's uh, way of speaking and how he's like galvanizing support and talking about like essentially dismantling the power structure uh, in his regime. So check this out. In verdad, esos primeros años. En esos primeros años se dio una batalla entre dos fuerzas que no pueden convivir dentro de un Estado, dentro de un gobierno, las fuerzas revolucionarias y las fuerzas contrarrevolucionarias. Y aquí quiero insistir, compañeros y compañeras, porque nosotros siempre hemos sido Notice the the appeals to sort of an ethereal nationalism um, that I think kind of holds up in the in the American case as well. Uh, notice that when Trump came into power, he was able to galvanize a, a small segment of the the population to such a degree that he was actually able to have them uh, storm a government building, which is a uh, Fascinating. Um, when the executive is successful, the regime slips into competitive authoritarianism. And the first reason is that the, where the executive uses their mandate to push the regime into competitive authoritarianism was particularly interesting because we saw a similar manifestation uh, of populist support destabilizing a country's institutions under the Trump administration. And obviously tracing the parallels across regimes would be like a, a very cool project. I would, I would like to like to do that would be pretty fun um a second conclusion uh levitsky and loxton reached uh where the executive eliminates institutions which would otherwise serve as a check is also fascinating there's a uh two books uh one is uh, miyamoto masashi's nine book of nine rings and sun tzu's art of war where they talk about essentially winning the battle before reaching the battlefield and that's what these these strongmen dictators or uh, personalists uh, outsiders typically do is they get rid of the potential checks on their power um and there's actually an article like later on that we'll touch on about like the retaliation um that kind of fits into this as well um and the third conclusion that they reach where the outsiders are inclined to shift the regime towards authoritarianism is, is mainly concerned with this tendency for outsiders to push the the regime to this other type and the results you know, table one captured this best, I think. Notice that every populist uh, candidate uh, pushes their their country towards competitive authoritarianism, which is a, a very odd pattern. And it's uh, in the continued uh, table as well. <clears throat> What's uh, fascinating about this, what I would like to explore is how this holds up across all regimes across like a, a very large uh, time frame. Um, I don't know why they pick these ones in particular so much as like it's, it's not that they were cherry picking, but it would be a much stronger argument if they were to look at this across the entirety of South America and Central America and they were able to Look at every regime type and how it ebbed and flowed into different levels of democratization and see what personal attributes of the leader actually pushed them uh, back and forth. I think it was a, not necessarily a missed opportunity, but certainly a, a larger project that I would be, I would like to see. Uh, which brings us to Andrea. Uh, so returning to Slater's original tension between horizontal and vertical accountability, Andrea uh, highlights the issue a bit more by zooming in on Bolivia. 
So prior to her research, a scholar said posited that the, the or, or citizens believed in, in Bolivia that the executive had too much power and the administration was prone to corruption. Institutions provided a weak check, uh, rights were not safeguarded, and the court system was corrupt and politicized. So scholars' initial inclination was to call Bolivia undemocratic. Andrea makes a, an interesting distinction by calling it democratic with an adjective. Uh, specifically, Bolivia could be char- categorized as, as a delegative uh, democracy, where the executive serves as a delegate for the people and has significant power afforded to them. Under this framework, the, the, the president has few horizontal checks. The elections are the sole vertical check uh, outside of domestic conflict. And uh, during this state, citizens uh, become more politically apathetic, minorities are disenfranchised, and the state's institutions uh, become more corrupt uh, and disorganized. However, Andrea makes a distinction uh, between her, her position and Guillermo O'Donnell's, which is what the previous portion came from. And Andrea points out several issues with this, this with categorizing Bolivia as, as uh, a delegative democracy. Uh, specifically, she shows that Bolivia's Morales accepted the 2016 referendum laws. Uh, social organization is high in Bolivia. Minority groups, labor unions, neighborhood associations, indigenous unions uh, have, have not been uh, disempowered. And the first table uh, in her uh, paper actually does a really good job in showing how the government itself does actually represent uh, the, at least in demographics, represents the actual uh people that they are serving notice that it hasn't really uh dropped off uh very much in any like uh social category uh of significance in, in particularly among those without the uh, societal power so yeah now there are some uh some still some problems in the bolivian case uh, there's still uh, persistent democratic weakness. Freedom of association is restricted. Executive power has grown uh, since 2009. Clientelism in the urban uh, organizations is still high. Morales uses uh, several uh, authoritarian tactics to maintain a stranglehold uh, on, on power, including threats and intimidation, repression, and often it attempts to divide the lower level power centers. So. Um, perhaps in the future uh, we can gauge the ebb and flow of democratization in the Bolivian case by examining the reports of abuses uh, over time. Uh, which brings me to the Gamboa piece. Um, so uh, previous research uh, posited that institutional power, economic development, state strength, uh, all positively or, or were the, the primary factors which could cause democratic backsliding. However, the literature often makes it seem as if it happens fairly quickly, where a populist leader ascends to power during an economic downturn, eliminates the checks on, on his power, disenfranchises minorities, destabilizes lower level power centers in, in their way, and ultimately shifts the state towards authoritarianism. Gamboa's stance on backsliding focuses on the, the opposition to the executive and takes a significantly more gradualist interpretation of backsliding. Sorry, I think someone is uh, cutting the grass. Um, so Gamboa's question is, why do some presidents successfully erode democracies while others fail? <clears throat> Gamboa proposes uh, two, two parts. Uh, first, the, the process of, of authoritarianism happens slowly. And the opposition to the executive has several opportunities to respond to the initial encroachment. The second piece is that the, the, the tactics that the opposition uses to push back against the executive determines the likelihood of their, their backsliding. On the second point, Gamboa posits that if uh, the opposition engages in tactics outside of the bounds of the law, they can lose legitimacy, ultimately making repression less politically costly uh, if the executive were to retaliate against the initial encroachment uh, from the legislature. Uh, for instance, if a president were to try to eliminate, I'm sorry, if the, uh, yeah, if a president were try to eliminate the impeachment process and the opposition responded by trying to forcibly remove her from office without a vote or through any legal means of impeachment, the executive would be more justified in responding with widespread repression. Um, and this reminds me of the tactics that terrorists use uh, against the state. 
uh, where insurgents will often sabotage oil pipelines, snipe from populated areas, commit lower level attacks uh, against smaller opponents with the hopes that the state will respond with overwhelming force. And then from there, the terrorist group is able to galvanize support from the local population and is better positioned to, to launch a, a larger attack. In Gamboa's case, the executive may chip away at institutions, but if the response is disproportionate or out of the legal framework established by the state, the executive can use their illegal retaliation as, as justification for a larger attack. So it's like the terrorist strategies, uh, but in reverse, uh, where the executive is the aggressor and the opposition is the responding actor. Um, yeah, I don't know if the analogy holds up for you because I can't see your face. Uh, well, anyway, uh, Gamboa, uh, the method uh, the use is with interviews with judges, politicians, journalists, and uh, academics. They also use archival research from Congress and newspapers. Uh, and they find that both uh, in the case of Venezuela and Colombia, uh, which is their, their focus of study, both uh, uh, legislatures had institutional leverage, but in the Colombian case, they used their institutional leverage to stop Uri Bay's election. In Venezuela, they used extra institutional uh, strategies to oust Chavez or try to oust Chavez, which failed uh, and allowed Chavez to retaliate uh, in kind. Um, so that was terrible. Uh, I really like Gambo's findings because it took the contextual factors surrounding the interaction between the executive and their institutions. Um, the first thing uh, I I appreciate it was the, the gradation of backsliding. This is a this is a, a kind of a chart from VDEM. But uh, I like the, the gradation of, of backsliding. Um so if you if you accept Gimbo's premise where backsliding happens gradually, the regime can slowly slide uh away from their, their most democratic era uh while maintaining the the democracy in name only. But in the meantime, scholars will, will still call the regime a democracy because it has all, all the former trappings of a democracy. But at that point where it begins to chip away at the democratic institutions, Gamboa would classify that as a competitive authoritarian regime as soon as it starts to slip. So returning to the spectrum from authoritarianism to uh, um, full democracies, Gamboa calls this, this process erosion when it starts to backslide, but perhaps a better name for it would be a rubber band backsliding, where a regime is immediately catapulted into the previous category when its institutions begin to be chipped away uh, by a person as leader, specifically when the elections have eroded and are no longer fair. The regime is, a, is then a competitive authoritarian regime. Um, so yeah, that's that. Let's go, we'll go to the next one. So the next one is a... Uh, as far as Gamboa, Gamboa effectively elucidated the relationship between the executive and the, late, and then the legislature, but Cher, Rosenfeld, and Stoyan examined the question from a, a different angle. Uh, it, it had already been established that executives often expand their authority by chipping away at the institutional constraints, uh, and the most important check against their creeping power is the legislature. But prior research had, had treated legislatures as essentially a rubber stamp institution with little ability to actually constrain the executive. So Cher, Rosenfeld, and Stoyan pushed back against that and point to the variation in legislative behavior where some legislatures are able to effectively curtail the executive assault on on constraints, while others are, are, are steamrolled. A central question is what explains the failure of legislatures to constrain the executive? And they argue that professionalized legislatures are better able to push back against the executive's expanding authority, and we would be better served by examining the informal attributes uh, which allow legislatures to be more effective against uh, uh, executive-induced backsliding. And this uh, professionalization uh, is essentially the legislature learning from past behavior and professional experiences, which allow them to better position themselves against the, the creeping powers of the executive. Um, where's the, here's the findings. So they observe uh, Argentina, uh, Bolivia, Brazil, Uruguay between 1990 and 2010, and they find that weekly professionalized legislatures fail to discourage decree issuance. This is even the case when there where there is a legislative oversight over the executive. Uh, decree issuance is akin to the American executive orders, which bypass the branches of government and effectively grants executive uh, grants the executive legislating powers. If the executive is able to pack the courts with allies, typically a, a surge of unchecked decrees can spell the end uh, of, of, for any checks uh, in the near future. 
Conversely, professionalized legislatures uh, by percent of professionalized num uh, members uh, are better able to discourage decree issuance. Uh, the reason professionalized legislatures are, are able to dissuade the executive power, the executive power grade, is because the executive anticipates the legislature's reaction and and pushback for against their tactics. So, they actually had uh, I think table two was the the uh, the the findings. Just the uh, table two. And their article actually presents the interaction where they look at the prior legislative experience and prior um, professional, sorry, uh, they interacted legislative experience with op opposition unity and uh, prior professional job with opposition unity. And both were significant and both decreased the, the likelihood of, of executive decree issuance. Um, and uh, just before I end, I wanted to show what a professional legislature looks like. Uh, in the case of America, when uh, the executive have, has overstepped or just the, the legislature's ability to, to get things through uh, and, and even galvanize public support. And I wanted to play Anthony Weiner on the House floor in America. General from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Weiner. Great courage to wait until all members have already spoken and then stand up and wrap your arms around procedure. We see it in the United States Senate every single day where members say, we want amendments, we want debate, we want amendment, but we're still a no. And then we stand up and say, oh, if only we had a different process, we'd vote yes. You vote yes if you believe yes. You vote in favor of something, you believe it's the right thing. If you believe it's the wrong thing, you vote no. We are following a procedure. I will not yield to the gentleman, and the gentleman will observe regular order. The gentleman will observe regular order. The gentleman thinks that if he gets up and yells on it, he's going to intimidate people into believing he's right. He is wrong. The gentleman is wrong. The gentleman is providing cover for his colleagues rather than doing the right thing. It's Republicans wrapping their arms around Republicans rather than doing the right thing on behalf of the heroes. It is a shame, a shame, if you believe this is a bad idea to provide health care, then vote no. But don't give me the cowardly view that, oh, if it was a different procedure, the gentleman will observe regular order and sit down. I will not. The gentleman will sit. The gentleman is correct in sitting. So it's just a small snippet, but it's like literally one of the like my favorite moments in in, in politics because it, it just showed like uh, it was very unusual uh, in the American case, um, and it is a very professional congressman who is uh, uh, using the bully pulpit to push things through. That is a level of uh, political savvy uh, that you you're not going to get in your first. Uh, term uh, as congressman the guy actually he actually ended as a disgraced congressman so we're just lost past that uh the last uh slide is on the actual discussion questions themselves uh all of these questions are on sakai um so yeah i think that's it um thanks bye